Julian Bream died yesterday. Uh, one of the world's great, perhaps one of the greatest classical guitarists of this generation, of this century, along with Segovia and Christopher Parkening. And uh, these guys were, you know, a holy trinity to me in the world of classical music. And uh, it makes me think again of of, uh, of John Higney, who introduced me to Julian Bream. I'd never heard of him. And uh, frankly, I've, I've spent the whole morning this morning watching Julian uh, give his master classes and different performances on YouTube. And it, he, it's, it, it, make, it brings to mind something that's very important in my story, is that it doesn't matter uh, what style of music you listen to. It's the quality of the player that you're listening to that you can take reams of knowledge from. Uh, when I watched Bream this morning, given a master class, uh, I recognized some of my own left hand fingering from him and things that he was doing and explaining and realized that he influenced me massively about simple things like uh, playing notes and making the string as long as possible. So in other words, if you can play a phrase down below the fifth fret, play it there instead of playing it up the neck where it sounds fatter and more muted and on and on it goes and if I, if I went and looked at any of my heroes I would be able to watch them and go uh, there's a thing I took and there's a thing I took and there's a thing and there's a thing and I'm a I'm a I'm a jigsaw puzzle with the, all of the pieces borrowed from these great players and uh, I was so lucky to to run into them when I did in my life and their music and their recordings and their, and now even in the last 15 years to be able to, to come on here on YouTube and watch these guys perform. It really is something. And, uh, it, it, it also reminds me that, you know, there's, there was a lot, a lot of different things going on, uh, in this period of my life in the mid eighties, that, that didn't necessarily have to do with guitar or even old time bluegrass or like bluegrass or Americana music. There was a lot of things I was being exposed to in those years that were, that were just completely, completely, uh, you know, morphing what I was doing, my technique and my, the ideas, like the possibilities that were being brought to mind by all this music I was listening to, exposed to, you know, by Murray and by Art Zilkowski and my buddy Graham Levy, who in, who basically in, in, uh, introduced me to just about every shredder electric player that there was. Guys like Ingve Malmsteen and Steve Vai and uh, Joe Satriani, who these men are, these guys really blew my mind. You know, Randy Rhodes when everybody else was listening to Van Halen, you know, who was a great guitar player, I was listening to, you know, I was listening to uh, Malmsteen because I was, I was attracted to the classical, he calls it neo-baroque or whatever they call it, like neo-classical. It was so much like Bach and Paganini and these things that I just... It was, uh, you know, it just, it, it was infectious. It was, it was uh, hard to, to ignore it, you know? And uh, especially if you love guitar. One of the things that always perplexed me about guitar players, it, it, it always confused me how, you know, a, a great number of the musicians that I've met in my life, uh, they don't have very open minds. Uh, and I, not all of them, like, but there's a, like, especially, I guess, I, I, 
I don't want to say this the wrong way, but I think maybe the players that are, let's say that are stuck at a certain level, that's below, that's below professional, right? They're not making a living playing music, but they play music and they play it well. And they, but they're, they could never go do it for a living because they haven't, they haven't got to that level quite yet. Or maybe they do do it for money, but they, they stay at some level that's not where the, perhaps they'd want to be after years of practice and playing and, and whatnot. And, and there's thousands of them, right? Thousands of people like that. I was always perplexed by them because those are the seem to be the people that are less willing to to listen to another style of music. And some of them like don't even see the value in other kinds of music other than the one that they play. And to me, that's incredibly dangerous because music is is universal. It it's it has a it's one language that can speak a thousand dialects, and so it would be like I liken it to being like let's say if we treated actual language the way some musicians treat music. If you went to another state or province where the accent was different, you wouldn't be able to understand a word they were saying. You wouldn't be able to speak to them. If, if we looked at language the way some people look at music, because some people look at music and if they go outside their own style, they, they don't understand it because they're, they're not listening. They, they kind of block out the possibility that there's something inside a different style that's exactly the same as the one that they play play and it's just being spoken differently and as soon as you do that you've you've closed the door on on something you could learn and and, and it's just if people ask me all the time like my students ask me people on here ask me like they they talk about my abilities as a musician you know, in these grandiose terms, but they don't, they, they, they don't realize that the only reason I get to the level that I'm at is from listening. I listened to everything and I purposely searched out the value of everything I heard. There's, there's an intrinsic value in all music and all music can be translated into your own dialect right and so at this period of my life in the mid 80s you know when the record was being made and all these other things were happening in the in sort of in the bluegrass americana flat picking kind of realm there was a lot of other things going on and, and i and when i watch watch these these programs back and you know, i go and look at them to check on where the story is uh, it always reminds me of things that happened, you know, in the in those in that time period. Um, but one big thing that was that had happened along in that time, probably when I was about fourteen, I got to go back to the Ladies' Choice Bluegrass Band, which hosted Up Home Tonight, which kind of launched my whole life. That television show. The guitar player from that band, uh, Billy Doucette, he was a Cape Bretoner. And uh, I somehow got tickets to see Doc Watson at the Rebecca Cohen Auditorium in Halifax. And I remember I took a bus up to Halifax from Bridgewater. And Bill came and got me and took me to the concert. I think he even got me the tickets, if I'm not mistaken. He was, again, one of these people that he knew I needed to see this, right? I think he bought me the tickets and... I went down on the bus and he took me to the Cohen to see to see Doc Watson. And we sat in the center about I don't know, maybe six, seven rows back. 
And Merle wasn't there. Jack Lawrence was playing with Doc that night because Merle was out sick. Merle hadn't been hadn't been killed then. He he, he a few years later he he died in a tractor rollover accident. And so I I sat there that night and just I I I I I never felt that way before in my life watching Doc Watson, you know, from forty feet away playing that Gallagher guitar through a Fender Twin Reverb amp. They had he plugged them in, and he was plugging in in those days. I'm not sure what he was using for a pickup, probably a Fishman or a ba uh, probably a Fishman. And he, he walked out there, on. they let him out, and God knows, it just completely just blew my mind. It just blew my mind. It was like seeing God on stage, right? It just... And he put on one hell of a show. It was one of the most brilliant things that I ever saw. It was just absolutely mind blowing to watch this guy perform, and and T. Michael Coleman on the bass, and they all sort of they all just sat. You know, Michael was in the middle, Doc was on the right hand side, Jack was across from, you know, sort of in a semicircle. God, it was amazing. Just completely tore me up. A super, super magic thing that Bill did for me. I'm not exactly sure how he pulled this off, but he, after the show was over, Billy got up and rushed down in the corner of the stage and talked to one of the ushers and got us backstage. And uh, I couldn't believe this. I couldn't believe it. And... Uh, we we walked back there, and there was a small crowd of people around Doc at the dressing room door. And they were talking to him, and they were getting him... <laughs> I remember this... Ha it's, this things you remember, right? There was an album, a new album out then called uh, Doc, and, uh, Doc and Merle's Guitar Album. It was a whole record of instrumentals, and I had it. It was a great record. And there was a lot of people there with it. And... As 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 Doc was being brought out of the dressing room, there was a there was somebody there, I guess maybe from the theater or maybe it was their road manager. I don't know who it was, but these people were standing there with records and sharpies, right? And this guy looks at the first fellow in the line, and says, "You know he's blind, right?" <laughs> and uh, some of the people didn't know. It was hilarious. It was it's so obvious Doc's blind. There's no you can tell he's blind. He was let out on stage. And uh so it was really funny. Like I I started giggling cuz I was like <laughs> they don't know he's blind. <laughs> and uh so he they brought him out and he he got his back against the wall there so you could tell where he was, you know. And they he he started they they just gave him the sharp and he just made a mark, you know, on the on the album, the, the LP covers, and uh, he got tied up very quickly with people. So uh, there I was, right by the dressing room door. Now this is a, an example of uh, of the of the size of my balls when I was a kid. I I I I was really timid really timid but for some reason i had no fear of uh i don't know what i the, i i was shy but i i had no problem busting up somewhere in and just go doing whatever and i, I and i i i over the years I believe I've lost some of that. I've lost some of my bravery, you know, in a lot of ways. Or maybe um, it's possibility that I've done so many things that the shine has sort of worn off of being brave. And I don't look for the thrills I used to look for. Uh, but so Doc is there doing his thing with all these people. So what do I do? I leave Billy, Billy lost me. He, he was out there. I walk in the dressing room. I walk in the dressing room and there's Jack Lawrence and, and Michael Coleman. And, uh, 
I started talking to them. I was just a boy. I was 14, maybe 14 years old, you know. And uh, I said, uh, I, I, I told them I played. And, uh, oh, yeah, you play, yeah. I said, I, 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 you know, Doc's my hero. I try to play Doc Watson stuff, you know. Really? Oh, yeah. I said, I said uh, so I, I, I think I just looked at Jack and said, where's Doc's guitar? <laughs> and he pointed to the case. It was on the, one of the, you know, one of the long kind of makeup tape. Like the, there was all, it was a theater dressing room. So there was mirrors and lights and. It was just sitting there on the on the counter in the in the cave. The case was closed. I said, uh, "I said, could I look? Could I look at it? Could I just see it?" And uh, Jack was sure. So why not? And he opened up the lid, and there it was, right, Donald, the Gallagher, the one that made all the greatest flat picking records I'd ever heard. And uh, so then, balls of iron. J.P. Cormier, well, John then, Balls of Iron Johnny, looks at Jack Lawrence and says, do you think I could play a tune on it? And Jack never even hesitated. Yeah, go ahead, yeah. And he, and, he, and he just picked it up out of the case and handed it to me. So I sat down on the, on the chair that was there, and I started to play the Black Mountain Wreck. And, uh, I nailed it, except for the, I blew the end, I was so, I was nervous at that point. Here I was playing Doc's Gallagher, right? And I, I blew the ending, the, the, the very last, the killer lick that Doc puts at the end of, of Black Mountain Reg. That wicked long string of craziness. And I flubbed about three or four notes in the end. And uh, when I was when I was done, Jack just was going, "Wow!" And then Doc, this is this is Doc, right? Doc sticks his head around the corner and goes, "Thanks for the compliment, son." And that was the greatest thing that was ever said to me at that at to that point. I got I got the praise from Jack and T. Michael. They thought it was amazing. This little kid come in and played. Black Mountain Rag, just like Doc Watson, except, you know, except for the ending. And, uh, but Doc didn't compliment my playing. He complimented his own playing. And it taught me something. He, he acknowledged that I did it well, but he didn't acknowledge me as a guitar player because, because I was playing his music. And it was not anything new he'd already done it and so I was tributing him and what I did was a compliment to his music what he had accomplished and I learned something that night you can't make your way and your life and your career just playing other people's things you'll never get any attention that way at least in those at that time, in the timeline, that was the way it was. Things changed as years went by because people forgot the old way, right? In the last 10 years, there's been massive advancement in guitar playing. People who have just taken it some other level altogether, you know, and it started with people like, you know, uh, well, all the other flat pickers that were around at that time, Prairie and Tony Rice and Norman Blake and on and on that goes. But then you had guys like Ricky Skaggs who came out as a flat picker in country music, playing a Martin with a pick in one of his fingers. And then that's that gave birth to Brian Sutton and Cody Kilby and David Greer and, like, the whole the whole world of guitar exploded. And and then, at that point, people forgot a little bit about the originators. And so, that's why I, as well as doing what I do on my own, I've started to lean back now into playing exactly what Doc played and exactly what Crary played, and on and on that goes, because nobody's doing it anymore. 
Well, Dan's still doing it, but Doc's passed away. So it's important to remember where things came from. But that night, I learned an incredibly valuable lesson. And there's only one Doc Watson. And there's only one anybody. And if you want to be in that list of there's only one, you have to invent something. You have to, you have to do something that sets you apart even slightly, or you'll never be doing anything but just tributing your favorite artist. It, it'll just be a, a nod of the head to the guy or girl that you love the most in music. And he taught me that in one sentence, and I never forgot it. And I, this, will come, this comes back to haunt me later in a good way with Doc. The other thing that was happening... However, with all of that stuff going on, like it's just incredible, as I said earlier in last week's episode, that there was just an avalanche of things. And the other thing that was going on at that particular time is I, Bruce Oaks, had come down and lent me a, f a fiddle. And uh, he brought a fiddle to the house and I, when I was about 13 or so, or 14, and I started playing. I started playing and... Uh, by the time I was 15, I was proficient enough. It was another, like, again, it was an instrument that I just understood from listening so much to fiddle music. And, of course, I gravitated to Winston Fitzgerald and Cape Breton music, but I also became a huge fan, always was a huge fan, of Graham Townsend and Don Messer and Carl Elliott. And, like, all the old-time players really appealed to me because it was so happy and jaunty and, and snappy and faster than Cape Breton music. And I, I played really fast when I was a kid, as all kids do, you know. And uh, by the time I was 15, I was proficient enough to start entering contests. And I met a, a, a young lady there who was the house accompanist for almost every contest that you could imagine because she was amazing. She was a, one of the greatest piano players I'd ever seen. And uh, for me to be able to play with a pianist after hearing it on records, you know, and never never actually getting to, getting to do it was just magical. And she made everybody play better and sound better. And uh, her name at the time was Kim Eisner. And... Um, she, uh, I think I've already mentioned that eventually she mar ended up marrying Skip Holmes, who was the banjo player from the Ladies' Choice Bluegrass Band that, that hosted up home tonight. So there was a cro there was a crossover there in my musical life when, when these two people got together, and uh, but she was a massive influence. I used to I ended up uh, like I learned most a lot of the things that I learned as a fiddler by Murray taking me down to their house, uh, Kim's mom and, mom and dad's house, a farmhouse way out in the country outside of Halifax. And uh, she had a nice piano in the house there, and I'd, I'd go in there and we'd play and play and play and play and play. A lot of it was recorded on cassette. I wish I had some of it left, but I don't. I don't know where any of it is now. But so she... She was a ma massive influence. I remember the first contest I, I, I went in, I, I think I came third in the under 16 or something. And then the following year I went in and, and actually won the open class. And uh, so that was all going on. There was a massive amount of information being absorbed there because I, I well, f frankly, contests for me I never liked competing. They were a source of income. And we needed income. So that's that's what I did that for. But that was all going on alongside, you know, the, like parallel to the whole other, you know, the rest of the development. And, um, and after the record came out, and, and this would have been in the spring, we did a summer of work, you know, and I played... Contest, fiddle contests and, and I went, you know, did bluegrass festivals. I believe I did another episode of Up Home Tonight that year. 
And um, then we just, Murray decided that we were going to go on tour. We were going to do a massive, this massive tour. He, he took a, he took an Atlas out and he, and he looked in the Bluegrass Unlimited magazine and he found, he made a, he compiled a list of festivals that were, that, that you could string together in a single road trip. And we based it mainly around going to Winfield, Kansas, to the National Flat Picking Competition. I, I had no idea at the time, uh, but this would be the trip. This would be the one, this would be the event in my life that set the rest of my, my path for the rest of my life. This one, this one sort of almost an ill-fated trip. <laughs> uh, we, Murray rented an, a, a trailer, an RV, like an, a, 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 a travel trailer, and decided he was going to pull it with this old Buick land yacht he had from the 70s. Like this rig was probably getting about four inches to the gallon. It was it was it was a big trailer, because there was uh, there was four of us. There was a buddy of ours went with us, Murray and Bill and me, and in this travel trailer, and off we went, and uh, we started in the first place we went to was Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, the festival there, and that's where I saw. Bill Monroe again, and it was his 65th birthday or 60th birthday or 65th, I think. And they they had rolled a big cake out on stage, and I saw the seldom seen that weekend, and I saw Bill Harrell, and like all, and and kept running into Ray. Ray Legier was really coming up in the bluegrass world at that time. He was he was getting really famous, especially in the states, and. Um, because frankly, his mandolin playing was was unheard of. The the level at which he played the mandolin, uh, and then later the fiddle as well, was just unheard of. Nobody was doing. Ray invented things that you know people like Chris Teeley and, and and these other players are credited with forging. But Ray did all of it first. Ray Ray was doing it in the, in the early eighties, and. Um, so, yeah, it, it became this almost a travel, it, a, a, a bluegrass palooza. We kept running into people that we knew at every stop. And um, uh, so from Gettysburg, we then went to Winfield, Kansas. Who was there? Ray. Ray was there. He's going to enter the Manlin contest, right? So... To make a long story short, uh, that uh, that weekend in Kansas, the second stop we made, was a real eye opener for me as well. I entered the contest; I didn't even place, and uh, I played well too. It wasn't my playing; it was the, the sheer level. And there was fifty players in this contest, and I think just about any one of them could have beat me. There, there. It was just another level. These were American players for the most part, and they lived it. They lived it. I realized from doing that contest that I had to, I had to live this music if I was going to actually play it accurately and successfully. The same as you would do, you know, anything, anything, especially you know, these these specific niche styles of music, Cape Breton fiddle, you know, American bluegrass flat picking, uh, g gypsy jazz playing. You have to go where it's being done by the inventors of it, right? And uh, so that was a fantastic weekend. Uh, Ray ended up winning the National Mandolin Contest, and he won the... I played rhythm guitar for him. We made the front page of the paper, because I don't think a Canadian had ever won that contest, and he he just blew their faces off, and he won a Nugget A style mandolin, which he plays to this very day. Um, so to kind of 
buttonhole this up. Uh, while I was hanging around that weekend, I had a great weekend. I met Dan Crary that weekend and John Hickman and Byron Berline. Uh, played with them. They were super nice to me. They really were really nice to me. Especially Dr. Crary. He, he was, uh, and is still my friend to this day. I love Dan. He's a great guy. But at one point, this would have been just after Merle had died. At one point, I was sitting behind the main stage where the contests were going on at this picnic table, and somebody came by with Doc Watson and dropped him there. Just left him at the table, and he sat down with his guitar. And I was sitting right sort of beside him, and I said, Doc, it's the boy from Halifax. And he remembered me. He looked, he looked over, and he said, Black Mountain Rag. I said, yes, sir, that was me. Well, how are you doing, son? And we had the most beautiful talk and at the table there, and he, 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 we reminisced about Merle, and he played me things. He had the guitar in his hand. He was like, Merle made this lick, and he played, and he played this beautiful thing, you know. And then I played him a couple of tunes that, he, you know, basically I think from home here. I played him a couple of our fiddle tunes and stuff on the guitar, and he just loved it. He was, he, 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 he was. He said, you know. I said, yeah, I said, you, you were quite a player when you were a little fellow. I said, and he said, I'm glad to see you kept playing, you know. And I said, of course I did. I mean, you're, you're, and I, and I got to tell him, you know, you don't have very many of these opportunities to tell your hero, you know, well, how you feel about them. And I got lucky many times. And I told Doc, you know, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be flat picking if it wasn't for you. You, you, you're the reason I do this. And he was just so nice to me. And it was a very, you know, melancholy kind of uh, poignant conversation. And uh, I remember I remember reaching out and, and patting him on the arm and, and saying, you know, I'm sorry about Merle. We all are. And uh, we we love you. Don't worry about you know. We're still with you. We'll be you know. Don't worry about it. We, everything's gonna be okay. And uh, you know he 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 thanked me. He said, "Yeah, I know. People are you know been really kind." And it just it was one of those moments. One of the first moments actually that I I saw my heroes uh, as people, which is incredibly important. They are just people. They have love, loss, all these things in their in their lives, that, and we just sometimes equate who they are to a groove in a piece of vinyl, you know. Or in this case, zeros and ones coming off a CD or an MP3. They're live. They're living people. They have lives, you know. And I and I saw Doc as a human being that that day, and I and I realized, and it made me love him even more and respect him even more. And uh, so, yeah, when I when I found out about Julian Bream yesterday, I thought there was a man, you know, that had a profound effect on possibly hundreds of thousands of guitar players. And he he might not have known us all of us, but we knew him. And but we only knew him through that that groove in the vinyl. And uh, he was he is one of the many players that I wish I had got a chance, you know, to thank him for what he taught me. He taught me the rudiments of Bach, of how beautiful it is when notes rub against each other. That's what I learned from classical and from Bach, especially, and from Julian Bream, is that there's something happening in music all the time, a movement between and against notes, notes playing against each other that that create this whole sound. And it it's it applies to every instrument and every style how those trains come in, in and out of the station and at what time they arrive and what time they leave and how long you can 
you can see a train out the window before it's gone, you know, of the first, it's just, it's, there's so many analogies for it, but it's, it's magic, and it's something that Julian Bream did so well, and all my heroes did so well. They all had that secret understanding of the mosaic of music. It's really something. Here's to you, Maestro.